So when you start a company with a name like MotherDuck, you have two options. One is you can run away from it and get offended when people call you a mother ducker uh, or pretend you have no idea what they're talking about. Or you can embrace it, you know, uh, embrace the duck puns and sometimes even wear the, wear the duck suit. Um, you know, so when Pete, you know, asked, you know, hey, I'll give you a, a, a keynote at Data Council, this amazing conference with all these amazing people, uh, in exchange for a little light humiliation, it was pretty clear which one, which one of those things I was going, to, uh, was going to do. But he didn't say I had to wear it the whole time, so if you don't mind, I'm going to take this off. It might be a little distracting. I do have duck socks on. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. I'm not going to strip anymore during this during this presentation. I promise. Um, okay. So who who am I? Pete gave me a great uh, great lead in, but just wh you know why am I talking about this? Wearing a duck suit, uh, etc. I was the guy that used to go around the world talking about how big data was going to change everything. Uh, I was, you know, an engineer on BigQuery, was the kind of the guy that liked to, liked to give, give talks, and so they would put me in front of crowds and I would run a query over a petabyte of data uh, and, uh, you know, impress people that, hey, you could query a petabyte of data. Uh, you know, I didn't tell people how much it cost. It was like a $5,000 query. It's like that was kind of behind, behind the scenes. But the thing that I kind of rapidly realized is that you know, none of our customers are actually running queries that look anything, anything like this. And started to kind of, an idea kind of percolate that, you know, hey, some of our, you know, a lot of our big query customers don't actually use big data. Um, so I'm gonna you know, give a talk. Uh, it's, you know, if you've read the big data is dead uh, post, I'm gonna elaborate on, on some of the things, go a little bit deeper on, on some things. Also talk about what, changes if, uh, if you believe that big data is, in fact, is in fact dead. Um, you're going to tell a story with graphs. The, the graphs are designed to be directionally correct, not, not actually correct. They're sort of hand-drawn. I don't have access to that data anymore. And if I did, I wouldn't be able to share it with you. So it's actually sort of the best of, best of both worlds. Um, but it is based on stuff that I kind of have seen in, in the real world. Um, so how many people have seen a graph like this uh, in somebody's slide deck? You know, basically, this is the scare graph. You know, big data is coming. Everything is changing, and uh, and of course, you better buy what I'm what I'm selling. Um, you know, th this graph has been used. This, you know, they change the date every you know every year. Kind of the date gets a little bit further out, and the graph goes a little bit a little bit higher up. But um, you know, it's it's. Uh, uh, you'd think that after 15 years, like kind of the the you know. Everything would have everything would have changed, and um, you know the last few years or so, I've you know been looking at at customers and how people were using data, and you know what people were saying about data at single store. Like for example, our most popular size of of instance was the smallest one, and that was a quarter of the size of the smallest Snowflake instance. And people kept asking for smaller, and it's like well, I just don't have that much data, and at BigQuery. There were just tons and tons of customers who, you know, were using it uh, with, uh, with with really pretty pretty modest amounts of amounts of data. Uh, so if you've seen DB engines, it's this like database people live by it. Uh, you know, they they check it every every month to see how their favorite databases are doing. But it basically tracks the popularity of databases over time. Uh, so MongoDB is the most popular NoSQL database, most popular sort of scale-out database. MySQL is a, as a scale-up database, um, and you kind of you think that these lines would be would be converging if big data had been changing had been changing everything. If you look at the new SQL databases, they're not even close to Mongo. Um, the the uh, so this is the OLTP side. The OLAP side looks a little bit different just because. Uh, I think the cloud transition has really uh, dominated a lot of these a lot of these effects. But clearly, like old school single single node systems are, have not become irrelevant. And you know, one of the reasons is just people don't have that much data. So like if you look at like the like the BigQuery customers that we had, you know, we had a couple customers that had hundreds of petabytes of data. The next largest customer was sort of like the tens of petabytes of data. And then because it's really this sort of like really fast, fast drop off. And there's a really long, long tail of you know people who need to do analytics. Um, 
with, with modest amounts of data. If you just think about being like a, so you're a B2B SaaS company. I was, you know, single store is a B2B SaaS company. Say you've got a thousand, a thousand customers, like that's not an unreasonable or a, a small number of, number of customers if you have to make enterprise deals every time. If you have a thousand data points over all those customers for three years, like that's a billion data points, uh, maybe a hundred gigabytes worth of, worth of data. Uh, so it's sort of pretty easy to see that like you can run a really successful business without having without having a huge amount of data. Uh, this is somewhat of a, a, a technical point. When uh, you know nowadays uh, separation of storage and compute has been has been uh, really kind of commoditized or is 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 table stakes. So you know BigQuery, Snowflake uh, have separation of storage and compute, Redshift, uh, Neon has added that on the on the OLTP side. Uh, and people kind of talk about separation of storage and compute as if they're kind of equal. Like, okay, well, sometimes I need a ton of storage, sometimes I need a ton of data. Um, but what happens kind of at the larger data sizes is that um, you, you end up not needing much more compute. So like this, is, this, this graph here is a log linear chart. So like if you increase your data size by 10x, you might only need one more, one more compute node. Um, and it's just, you know, there's a couple reasons for that, and, and, um, and I'll get into it in these, these next couple slides, but I think this is something that's, that's kind of under underappreciated. So one of the reasons for it is um, people end up using less data than you'd think. So the, the 90th percentile query in BigQuery was 100 megabytes of data. And this is of customers, these aren't like tiny customers, these are customers spending over $1,000 a month. Uh, these are people that are doing kind of real world, you know, real world production analytics. Uh, they just do a ton of ton of small small queries. Um, you know, the uh, you know you don't have to get up very high and you know very very far along the along the size to uh, to get to kind of the 99th, 99.9 percentile. Yes, there are some queries that are that are larger than that, but in general, those are uh, those are really ones where a human isn't present. So if you think about kind of human in the loop, like I'm running a dashboard, you really don't want to be to be crunching you know massive amounts of data because like it's going to be it's going to be slow uh, and it's going to be expensive. Like so like you know people have figured out a way to make uh, you know large scale queries fast by parallelizing, but they haven't really figured out a way to make them uh, inexpensive. Yeah, hence my you know five thousand dollar petabyte query. The other thing is. You know, just there's a real recency bias to how people access their data. You know, most of the data that's on disk just ends up sitting there. Because, you know, the vast majority of the queries that people do, it's like, what happened in the last, what happened yesterday? Or uh, what happened in the last week? What happened in the last two weeks? What happened in the last month? When you get past a month, uh, it, you know, data gets pretty quiet. So one of the things that, you know, we did in big, you know, this, you know, understanding this data comes from, I was trying to do some analysis on how do we how do we keep how do we get people to keep their data, because if they're not querying their old data, then chances are they're not gonna they're not gonna keep it. And for us, it was actually you know really we had really good margins on old data that just sits there, as you as you may be able to to imagine. Um, another kind of interesting thing that's happened that's happened over time since uh, you know the last 15 years is scale up has really become a lot more a lot more viable. You know in um, you know, Google produced a series of a series of papers uh, in the you know early 2000s that really changed how people built uh, built data systems. First, there was uh, MapReduce, then GFS, then Bigtable, then Dremel, and um, you know after that, everybody you know starts thinking about how do we how do we scale out on commodity hardware instead of instead of scaling instead of scaling up. Uh, CTO of a database company said to me, you know, a year ago. Um, you know, hey, if, you, uh, if you're not a scale out uh, database, people are going to laugh at you. As you may notice, I'm not so worried about people laughing at me, but I think there's also, um, there's also something to be said for, for, for scaling, scaling up. So in you know, 2006, when AWS came out, the largest AWS instance you could get was you know, one core and, uh, and two gigs of RAM. There's a lot of workloads that don't necessarily fit in that. Um, now, now, the reason that scale up used to be more expensive is because a larger machine would cost you more than, like a 2x machine size would cost you 4x or 10x in, um, uh, in actually buy, buying that hardware. And, but if you look at the actual like, physical server sizes that AWS is using, they're pretty monstrous. Like, so they, you know, and they don't charge you, if you get half that machine, 
If you get two halves of that machine versus one whole of that machine, it costs the same. Um, you know, so the, the standard instances are 64, uh, 64 cores, 250, 256 gigs of RAM. Uh, the standard memory optimized instances, there's a bunch of different, different ones, you know, a terabyte and a half of RAM, 192 cores, then they even go up to 445 cores uh, and 24 terabytes of RAM. There's not a whole lot of workloads that don't fit in, in that, that, amount of, that amount of hardware. Uh, the other reason that you know, people used to, to not trust scale up is, so if you, if you have an on-prem data center, you buy this really expensive piece of, piece of hardware to run your, to run your database server, um, you need to have another one in case that one breaks. And uh, the cloud has really changed that because like, Amazon's got plenty. So like your, you know, your database breaks or you have a crash or something happens, chances are you won't even know it. Amazon will just you know, replace it from un underneath you. Um, so the Dremel paper came out in 2008, I believe, and it kind of blew people's mind with how fast you could, you could query really large amounts of data. Um, so I kind of wanted to look at the benchmark that they ran and see if you can re replicate that on a, single, on a single machine. So this is just sort of like kind of theoretical numbers. I didn't, you know, this isn't saying like, you know, DuckDB is, is, uh, can, can do this, but, um, you know, it, the, um, the, the, the math works. So, uh, you know, basically there's, there's enough CPU so, so what they did is they ran, the, you know, query one, which is the one they have the, uh, the graphs on, they ran um, uh, over 80, 87 billion rows. Like the overall data set was, I think, something like 70 billion or 70 terabytes. Um, but they only, it's a column, uh, column store, so they only had to read half a terabyte. Um, they did that across 3,000 nodes in about 20 seconds. And uh, kind of on modern on a modern scale up system. So this is AWS i4i. You know you can get those in a whole bunch of different uh, different regions. There's enough CPU um, to to be able to that based on some like published benchmarks that single store has come out about how many rows they can process. Uh, they have you know plenty of uh, you know plenty of ability to process that many rows. Um, there's enough RAM to sort of to to be able to to have all that in in RAM. Um, the, uh, if, if it's cached in SSD, there's plenty of SSD. So basically, um, the only thing that doesn't work is if you have to read it cold. So the things that a single, single node instance still doesn't, that doesn't do ideally is, is have massive amounts of I.O. Um, but there are kind of newer instances coming that, that have, uh, have more, more I.O. For example, there's a, what was it, a TRN1 instance that has 800 gigabits uh, of, of, uh, of networking. And that actually is enough to to uh, to do this. So, you know, kind of what seemed like like uh, like science fiction because you could do just massive amounts of uh, of work all at the same time. Now, you know, you can uh, you know just spin spin it up on on AWS. So the kind of where the uh, the frontier for big data is has been has been receding. So it used to be the kind of like okay, big data. I've got gigabytes. That's big data. Um, you know the the frontier for which you really have to use big data techniques has been has been increasing over time, and likely that will is going to continue uh, uh, to uh, to increase. So you know, let's say you have big, you have you have lots of data, and your data workloads are actually pretty large. Um, uh, you know, why else might big data not be not be something that um, uh, that you should be dealing with? And so this is the same graph as the first graph. So the first graph just said bytes and time, but bytes and cost are really the same. And so uh, over time, you're, if your data is increasing exponentially, your costs are also increasing exponentially. And any exponential cost progression eventually is going to kill you. And so you're going to have to figure out some way around this. Now, there's a couple different ways of doing it. One, you could sort of do filtering at the source. Two, you could you know, go back and look at your old data. Uh, to see what it is that you could you could throw out, um, the highest powered room that I've ever been in was like Google had this technical advisory board with a bunch of Fortune 50 CTOs, and uh, you know we asked them what do you think about data lakes, and um, you know these people didn't agree on anything. Like one of them was like talking about hey what are you guys doing on quantum, uh, and uh, but the one thing that they did agree in is like they hated their data lakes, and they're like they're just data data swamps and they're really expensive. I have no idea what's there. 
The problem is with like GDPR and all these privacy regulations, if you don't know what data you have, then uh, you know, chances are you're not actually complying with these, with these things. Um, you know, from a legal perspective, you know, data, can be, data can be a legal liability. We've gotten used to having um, uh, retention periods for, for email, so that you know, that email you wrote about you know, uh, scamming your customers uh, you know, can't be found in, uh, in discovery. Well, if it's in the logs, then it can be found in discovery. And not saying you should be scamming your customers, but sometimes you know there's things that you things things that are broken. Uh, there's there are bugs. You maybe you overcharged or something. Uh, again, not saying you should do any of these things, but um, but having that data forever is is basically you're having a legal liability forever. Um, so you know being able to summarize the data can be can be super helpful, especially if you consider like. Most of the time, you actually look at the old data. You rerun the same query that you already ran. You just add a new day, and the new day is like is a new day. It's not an old day. So, um, you know, you can generally summarize that data. Data, you know, the, the interpretation of data changes over time. So, your ability to actually extract good insights from older data is uh, is decreasing. And I probably don't even have to. I could have skipped this slide for you folks because you probably know all this stuff and intrinsically like deal with this deal with this every day. But um, you know, I think as as uh, you know, because the data generation is increasing over time, you know, we are going to have to increasingly, increasingly handle this, increasingly be able to sort of cut it down, cut it down to size. So, just to sort of summarize so far is like, you know, yes, there are you know some people that are that do still. For whom big data is still is still important, but I, I would say that that's not the vast majority of people. Um, you know, that would have to be if you really have a truly large amount of data, uh, you need to query it all at once. Um, it doesn't fit on one machine. We've seen that that actually is you know one machine can fit a, can fit a ton of work, um, and you shouldn't be summarizing or or deleting some of that data. Um, so, let's say you agree that. Um, the data size is not everything, and maybe it shouldn't be driving how you're designing and building your your data system. So what you know what changes? Sometimes it's nice to think about just in, in general, like okay, if you remove this constraint that was driving how I was doing things, like what what would change about the world? Um, well, first one you know is don't don't be afraid to uh, don't be afraid to scale up. Uh, you know everybody you know scale up is is um, is entirely is entirely reasonable. Um, scale up architectures, scale up systems. Um, you know, I think are are now going to be going to be more viable, especially especially in the cloud. You know, clean up your data. Uh, you know, again, likely I don't need to tell anybody to, to do this, but you know, organizing governance, all the like all the good stuff you can do to make sure you don't have like you know uh, nasty nasty ugly data sitting around. Um, so this is an interesting one. You know, when we started BigQuery, one of the mantras w w we had was it's from Jim Gray, the uh, the Turing Award winner, uh, database uh, um, guru uh, from Microsoft Research, Microsoft Research, and he used to say, you know, when you have big data, you want to move the compute to the data rather than the data to the compute, because act the actual cost of moving data is so is so expensive. But let's say you you agree that you know your data size might not be that large, uh, you know that doesn't necessarily hold anymore. So can you actually take your uh, your data and push it out to where the user is? Uh, so like laptops these days, like you know I've got an M2 laptop, uh, you know on my on my desk, you know those are incredibly powerful computers. Actually, um, uh, George Fraser, the 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 CEO of Fivetran, just Published a blog post the other day where he compared uh, an uh, you know DuckDB running on his laptop against a 16-core uh, cloud-based data warehouse on a uh, you know TPC DS you know typical uh, you know database database benchmark, and his laptop was faster. So that's just one that's just one benchmark. But like people have a huge amount of power on their on their on their on their home computers, and so if you run a query. And you wait for you know three seconds while this expensive cloud resource is 
uh, is computing computing that result. You know, meanwhile, that cl cloud resource is contested by you know 60 other people in your organization that are trying to trying to use that same hardware. Um, and meanwhile, this like incredibly powerful machine on your on your that you have on your desk is sitting idle. Like that doesn't seem an ideal use of of resources. So, kind of, I think there's a new a new frontier where we can actually start pushing work out to the to the end user and not having to rely on on expensive cloud cloud hardware. This also comes into play when you know when data is generated. Let's say um, you know you have an IoT scenario or you something is on on mobile or you have um, data is being generated in a distributed fashion. In general, the way we we handle this is we kind of move all the data to the centralized location and um, and then we do the, the the computation on it. But you know actually we can actually do the compute out where the uh, the data is actually produced. Uh, and the other thing is, one size might not fit all. Kind of, I was mentioned before the difference between doing, uh, you know, user in the loop versus user not in the loop. You know, if there is a lot of data being generated, you might have to do some expensive transformations of that data uh, that might need more scale out techniques. But in general, when you're, you know, the things where you have human in the loop, you're running your dashboards, you're running your, you're running your analytics. Um, you know that can be that can be done on a uh, on a different system, and um, you know of course uh, life is better with a duck. Has anybody heard of a database called DuckDB? All right, everybody has everybody's heard heard about DuckDB. Have, has anybody heard how it can change your life? I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go I'm not gonna go into into uh, into too much uh, duck posting, but I will kind of go into an, perhaps an extended analogy. And this is uh, something we used to we used to talk about at uh, at Google. We used to talk about kind of the an overall analytic systems as a as a happy meal. So you had your transformation, ingestion, orchestration as the French fries. You know, French fries are um, you know the kind of mainstay of the happy meal. Um, uh, perhaps un underrated, uh, but um, but incredibly important. Uh, then you had the you know the visualization, the BI, the data science. The modeling, um, and this is sort of the the sweet and the kind of the fun, you know, the the, the fun part of it. Um, and then in the middle is kind of the core is your your analytics uh, and your analytics engine. Uh, and you'll have to forgive me for kind of putting, you know, the analytics engine at the middle. Um, you know, that was my job. But as anybody who um, either remembers being, you know, eating Happy Meals, ordering Happy Meals, or has you know knows people who order Happy Meals. Like, what's the one thing that this is missing? A toy, exactly. That's why I brought one with me. <laughs> so what happens when you add a duck to this? Um, so, you know, visualization layer, the BI layer, let's say, let's say you're adding a duck. Now, there's a bunch of people already, you know, startups uh, that are in this, you know, folks that are in this room that are adding... DuckDB to their visualization layer. DuckDB runs in the browser, so they're adding kind of web-based, uh, web browser-based based DuckDB, um, hex, real data, Omni, observable. Uh, there's a there's a ton of a ton of folks that are that are putting DuckDB in the browser because because it brings like the power and the and the express expressiveness and the reactiveness to their uh, to the to their user interfaces. Um, so, but you can also add add DuckDB to your. Uh, I was going to say to your French fries, uh, to your to your ingestion uh, and orchestration process. So there is a DuckDB DBT connector. Um, there's DuckDB being added for a bunch of you know sort of data data ingestion transformation tools, and that's one of the things actually that um, you know Hannes uh, from uh, you know the 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 CEO of DuckDB Labs has has talked about is. That you know, there's more and more people that are building pipelines using using DuckDB. So this is sort of a really powerful way of just sort of being able to, you know, do your analytics kind of wherever it wherever it lives. And then the last part is, well, if you uh, you know, being able to put DuckDB in your do in your analytics. Now, I think this is so far less common, but there's something really cool about about this is, is so basically if you have you know, ingestion. You DuckDB when you're ingesting the data, uh, DuckDB when you're visualizing the data, DuckDB when you're analyzing the data, sort of DuckDB all the way through. You have this, not a modern data stack, it's a modern duck stack. 
and um, they can be they can be super uh, they can be super powerful. And um, and one other kind of just nice things that I, I will I will mention is you know uh, when you have this many this many ducks, uh, you need somebody to keep those ducks in the line. Who's good at keeping ducks in the line? A mother duck. Sorry for the sorry for the pun. Um, it, it comes it comes with the job. Um, but the other thing that kind of all this is is you know is enabled by the you know the sort of the the, the fact that data size isn't the most important thing because if if you if you have to be dealing with massive data and if you're like this you know my data is is huge then you know okay you're not going to want to put duckdb in the ingest or the or the visualization and you're not going to want to use it as your uh, as your as your storage layer but kind of once you once you recognize that we're kind of perhaps in a in a new in a new world then um, you know it allows you to do all sorts of uh, nice duckiness um, that's that's it. Uh, thanks, everybody.